welcome and um, introduction. This is the Tools and Technology Seminar Series, and it's great to see people uh, logging on. Uh, for anybody who's new to the seminar series, it is a uh, basically just a venue to discuss tools, technologies, methodologies, uh, recently in development, currently in development, um, maybe not even developed by the speaker, but just uh, some tool or technology that's useful um, for the community. And you know, we're always looking for speakers. So if anybody um, does want to present in the future, to please contact me. And I think that is everything I have. So with that, I'll let uh, Matt introduce himself and give his presentation. Great. Thank you, Marcy. Um, thanks, Erin, for the tech support, too. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk and for you to come and listen. Um, I'm a new uh, research faculty in the Department of Bioinformatics, DCMB, and um, I've got caught up in the uh, working on SARS-CoV-2, as I think many of you have. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some of the initial progress we've had in doing drug discovery for it and some of the methods and tools that we've developed along the way. So I started last year um, in the department and uh, the focus of my lab is in several different areas all around computational pharmacology. Uh, so I do some uh, protein therapeutic engineering. This is the design of a bacterial enzyme to treat strokes. And then also we do virtual screening. So take uh, libraries of compounds and, and uh, computationally dock them into the receptors to see if we can find drugs that may fit. And then also um, experimental design, where we're doing um, Bayesian optimization of the, of the information gain in an experiment to try to find conditions that would um, improve the experiment. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, work on developing um, high content pharmacology. So here the endpoint is not just a yes or no, or live or dead, or works or doesn't work, but it's a rich um, array of, of endpoints. So we've done some work with electrophysiology where you have spike trains for individual neurons. But here, I, um, this is based on a collaboration with the Sexton lab, uh, where we're using uh, high content microscopy to measure lots of features of individual cells. So we're trying to understand at the cellular level, how does treatments or different conditions affect the cell? So we're still going to get dose responses, but now we have lots of dose responses for lots of different effects. OK, so the unifying theme of my lab and, and how I like to think about problems is um, uh, it's cross-disciplinary between the biological sciences and math and computer science. Um, and so oftentimes it's helpful to have a common language for how to describe a problem. So I like to think of it the sort of updated version of the scientific method uh, where we have some natural process that we really care about and we can do pharmacology on it. So we can perturb it with a drug or some sort of condition and measure some sort of response. So this gives us information about the natural world but unfortunately, this is often slow, expensive, dangerous, and ethical. Like for instance, we can't test drugs in people um, uh, without having some sense that it might not be toxic. So what we do is instead build models for this process that's happening in the natural world. And then if we perturb and measure the response in the model, um, then that gives us some inclination about what's gonna happen in the natural world. So this is often faster, cheaper, safer, more ethical. And this model can be, take the form of, like, say, a model organism, like a mouse, or a cell in a plate, or even a computational model where we could say, you know, how does the, um, how do we predict the response to happen? And what, one of the areas that I find particularly fascinating is that oftentimes there's a hierarchy of models. So instead of having um, just one layer where we're going down to mice, we often have a whole sequence of models that are more and more reductive. And so trying to find the, the most reductive system where we can very quickly test something and then move that up the hierarchy towards getting it into the clinic or uh, understanding of the full process in general. So moving up and down between um, different systems and trying to understand what we can learn about the natural process in that system and then into computational systems. Um, oftentimes we think of computational models as being fully understood because we can you know, uh, reproduce them by setting the same random seed. But oftentimes these computational models are um, computationally expensive to run and difficult to control, especially with say deep learning models. So um, trying to understand how the computational models work, we can use the same idea of, of coming up with simpler statistical models to try to capture what's going on in the process. So what we want is the, this uh, to be representative. So in the context of drug discovery, um, the main idea is that we're gonna work our way up this hierarchy in realism with uh, increasing costs. So uh, moving up from 
computational to the in the test tube to maybe in a slice to yeah, this is mercy i'm just gonna interrupt for a second are we supposed to be seeing slides at the moment oh my goodness How, are we not seeing slides <laughs> we're not seeing slides oh my goodness okay thank you so much for stopping me sure. um, very far without uh okay is it where are we do you see anything at all no okay let me try reconnecting at least stopping sharing or starting sharing Thank you for, for stopping. Oh yeah, now we're seeing your slides. Okay, thank you. Yep, we're not in present view at the moment, but. Okay, should be. Yep, that's perfect. Better? Okay, yep, perfect. Uh, oops, let me just go back real quick. So we have protein therapeutics, large scale virtual screening, optimal design and high content pharmacology. So this is the, uh, the natural uh, observational model, the natural process that we care about. And then uh, this is where I had just left off. So we're working our way up the hierarchy um, in uh, the drug discovery. So most of what I'm gonna tell you about today is um, where we're putting drugs onto plates, not just at test tubes, and trying to understand how, how the cells respond. Okay, um, so this work is um, a really fantastic collaboration. Um, Johnny Sexton um, had the Michigan Drug Discovery um, and the um, internal medicine have this drug repurposing uh, center. So the idea is to use this high content microscopy to understand different diseases. And his area of expertise is in um, liver injury. Um, but with the SARS, uh, he really took the lead in trying to recommission the BSL-3 facility um, uh, in, the, um, in the building. And then uh, he has some graduate students and team. And then also we, we, um, we were really lucky to find that a postdoc and Christiana Wallace's lab, Carmen Romeo Belli, had been uh, trained in BSL-3. And so she was, at the start, the, the primary virologist that was going in and doing all the work. So I, I had uh, started to work with Johnny to understand how to analyze these um, high content screening uh, data sets. And so we all worked as a, um, a really uh, a fantastic collaboration and team uh, since March, just to really uh, be very productive and, and trying to understand how we can use this technology to look at uh, SARS-CoV-2. So I just also want to mention that we had um, support not only from, from Carmen, and, and, but also Christiana um, was instrumental in getting the BSL-3 uh, facility back up and working. Um, she's an expert biologist um, in the microbiology department. And uh, Teresa was uh, deeply engaged in, in helping us um, frame the questions and, and understand the experiments um, from a, a really uh, um, a robust microbiology experience. And then I, also we had a number of, of um, key admin support, uh, both for the um, uh, Drug Repurposing Center uh, with Kevin Weatherwax and, and George Mershur. And um, I'm a research faculty, so I'm in, in Brian Athey's lab. So he's given me a lot of support as well. And then uh, to make the whole thing happen, we had a, a lab managers in Johnny's group of, of Tracy and Carl. So we have a um, preprint of our initial paper up on the bioarchive, and it's uh, currently under review at Nature Communications. So, um, you can read it and it will be out soon in your publication. Okay, so uh, how does this work? So when we get um, an image of a well on a plate, uh, these are the cells. We get uh, nine uh, frames per well and it's 386 wells per plate. And so this is, uh, we can stain the cells with uh, different dyes and then image them to, um, to find. So this is a nuclear stain, uh, but we can also stain with uh, for lipids, uh, and for the cytoplasm and for the virus. So when we layer them all together, we get um, a rich uh, perspective um, of what, what's going on uh, within individual cells. So there's, you can see there's really a, a wide range of phenotypes and um, heterogeneity going on. Some cells are infected, some cells are maybe infected, and you know, there's a, a range of different things going on. Some are, are more full of lipids than others, for instance. So our, our goal is to try to understand under what conditions are the cells being infected and how can we use drugs to try to um, understand how it's perturbing that process. So um, the rapid assay development that, that was done uh, was to try to find a cell line that was um, permissive for a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we screened Vero E6, which is a monkey kidney cell line, KCO2, which is um, a carcinoma line in, in the gut, and HUH7 cells, um, uh, which is another cancer cell line. And um, we were looking for what is the days post-infection that gives us the best um, response. 
And then also what is the, um, the multiplicity of infection that we get enough uh, um, cells that are infected, but not uh, totally uh, non-physical. So there's a number of these assay parameters that, we're, that we've developed, that were developed um, uh, very quickly and we've uh, continued to refine them. So Kiko 2s are maybe our new favorite cell line. Um, but in any sense, um, part of the job of, of informatics is to uh, very rapidly be able to give back information about you know, what is the, um, uh, which uh, are the degrees of freedom in the experiment that we can uh, poke and prod in order to get more information out of the system. Okay, so um, just as a control or you know a, a test case, um, remdesivir, as you know, is um, one of the few drugs that has shown some promise um, in the clinic. And so uh, the negative control, this is uh, infected but not treated. And then when we put remdesivir on it at um, you know, a quarter of a micromolar, uh, we see that virtually all of the, um, the virus is gone, except for perhaps a few uh, punctate spots, which may be aborted infections or or um, misfolded viral protein. So here we're using um, the nuclear capsid stain for the viral protein, um, but you could also picture um, staining for other, other viral proteins as well. Okay, um, so the format for the screen that we developed was uh, we take in um, a library of FDA approved and clinical candidate compounds. And in the primary screen, we did uh, five doses per compound, um, which is 25 plates. Um, and what we were screening for was um, we defined a classifier uh, between, that separated out the negative controls from the positive controls um, using uh, a random forest. And then we counted, and then we were able to score each cell um, by uh, segmenting it using cell profiler um, and then uh, being able to um, uh, predict or quantify if each cell is infected and then count the number of infected to total cells within each well. Um, so what we get is a, um, a dose response curve, you know, with five points uh, for each of the drugs. And then uh, from this, we identified uh, 132 candidates that we wanted to follow up with uh, for dose response. So uh, the way this dose response works is, you know, um, you uh, increase the, the dose of the drug and then measure if it's killing the cells and then also if the percent of infected cells is going down. So this is remdesivir, which we knew to be uh, effective. Um, and additionally, this is another example of, um, uh, it's called S1RA, and um, it's a, a um, compound that's not in the clinic yet, but it's known to be selective for um, the sigma receptor, which I'll come back to later. So just to um, give you a flavor for what these dose responses look like, um, what we get, the, so if you're not familiar with pharmacology, the, the key parameter is the half maximal activity of the, um, of the drug. So what, at what dose do we uh, lead to half the response, in this case, the number of percent infectivity? So that, that, um, that concentration is important for trying to understand um, how we might be able to uh, dose it uh, in order to make it effective. So as you increase the dose, um, compounds tend to interact non-specifically with lots of other proteins in the body. And so typically uh, for uh, you know, a, a medicinal chemistry campaign, having an activity of in the low nanomolar is ideal, although there are exceptions where, where there's um, compounds with, with more activity than that. So it just it becomes a harder, more challenging problem to, to find the, the mechanism of action and, and, and also the off-target effects um, as the selectivity or specificity of the target uh, is not as potent. Okay, so... Um, I'll just go briefly through some of the um, biology around these um, about two different uh, classes of drugs that, that we're excited about. Um, one is uh, sigma ligands. And also I just wanna point out that, um, that we aren't the only ones doing drug repurposing screens for um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. I think there's probably now a dozen or more um, uh, screens of various sizes that, uh, that have been done. And uh, one that I was involved with um, through uh, UCSF, where I did my postdoc, um, was uh, we also identified a number of compounds that had activity at sigma receptors. So um, haloperidol and, and hydroxychloroquine you might, um, might be familiar with, um, but uh, ma many of the antipsychotics and antihistamines um, uh, tend to be active at sigma receptors. And so this whole class of drugs seems to be active. Um, so this is a um, summary of a slide from 
uh, paper that, that um, came out in, um, in April, uh, where we were looking at, um, this is, so this is in another lab, uh, and we were looking at both hydroxychloroquine and, and PB28 and at different time points of infection. So not, not all of the sigma ligands are effective. So dextromethotan is a, um, is a uh, you could take it for colds, it's an antihistamine. And so it seems to be not, um, either not infective or, uh, or not effective or slightly um, worse. So I think some care needs to be taken about trying to understand what is the mechanism that's going on here. Um, so just um, to get at uh, some of the structural activity relationships, um, uh, we have a structural model for how these drugs fit into the binding site. Um, so this is in both um, uh, in, in the sigma-1 receptor, and uh, these are uh, chlorporacetine and uh, pendazosine, which is the compound that the sigma receptor was crystallized with. So this is chlorporacetine and clemestine. So many of these drugs, as I said, hit lots of different targets. Um, it seemed that at least of the ones that we tested, the common denominator was that they were hitting the sigma-1 receptor as well as the sigma-2 receptor, uh, which is um, known to have a very similar, uh, um, sent similar molecules. So it's, it's not an homologue of the sigma-1 receptor, but they're often grouped together because of, they recognize their similarities. Okay, so one consideration with these is that um, many of these drugs are known to also hit the, um, it's called the HERG ion channel. And um, so many drugs um, have been pulled from the clinic because they uh, can cause uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, so you perhaps have heard of some of the controversy around hydroxychloroquine. And part of that is that if it's not working and it has this side effect of cardiac arrhythmia, then if you give it to millions and millions of people, then you know, some fraction, some you know, non-trivial fraction of people will, will have uh, adverse reactions. So hydroxychloroquine is widely used for malaria and for arthritis and lupus and some other autoimmune disorders. So obviously people do take it, but just care needs to be taken. Okay, so um, going a little bit into the biology of the sigma run receptors and how this might, um, might actually be functioning. Um, the, it's a sigma run receptor is a um, resident ER uh, chaperone um, on, in the membrane, and it's involved in mediating ER stress response. Uh, so here are some of the drugs that may target it. Uh, these are ones that are uh, available either over the counter or hydroxychloroquine. And we got into this um, through the, um, the UCSF collaboration because NSP6, which is one of the non-structural proteins in uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, physically associates uh, with the sigma-1 receptor um, uh, in a uh, proteomics um, AP mass spec experiment. Um, uh, so uh, the biology of the sigma-1 receptor is that um, um, under uh, uh, stress, such as with the um, SARS-CoV-2 forming these double membrane vesicles uh, out of the ER, um, that this uh, leads to the sigma receptor um, coming and um, chaperoning, disassociating from an inactive state to chaperoning the I3PR, which is a calcium channel, which releases calcium adjacent to the mitochondria. And so this stimulates a, a whole host of of, um, of stress response uh, from, from the mitochondria, as well as um, the IRE1, which is uh, one of the main drivers of the unfolded protein response. Uh, so um, uh, BIP is a, a chaperone in the ER that chaperones uh, many of the unfolded protein response um, components. And when it disassociates, sigma-1 partially soaks up um, uh, BIP. So it's unclear if, if what the causal relationship here is if the stress is causing the sigma-1 to disassociate and soak up BIP, which releases these factors, or the, um, the BIP comes out and, and attacks the sigma-1 receptor, which activates these things. In any sense, um, there's been a nice study that, that um, compares thapsigargan, which is a known uh, ER stress um, inducer, to the stress that's involved in uh, the SARS-CoV-2. And so there's many similar similarities and some important differences uh, between these different stresses. So trying to understand how exactly is SARS-CoV-2 stressing out the, um, the ER, um, perhaps through depleting um, uh, lipids, um, and how can that be uh, targeted as a drug response pathway, I think is, is uh, rapidly, uh, uh, our understanding of it is rapidly improving. 
Um, so I just want to highlight up here that um, two important pathways that uh, seem to be important for downstream of the unfolded protein response is the IL-6 uh, pathway, which you may have heard about, is um, involved in, um, so not necessarily in the airway epithelial cells, but in uh, immune cells, um, when the IL-6 was released, it can, um, it can uh, be released at such high levels that it causes um, a cytokine storm and, and has something like sepsis. So some, some of the people are, are um, in grave critical health because of, of the, not necessarily the infection, which is bad, but because of the overactive immune response. So toxilizumab and, and others uh, were, were aimed to try to target the IL-6 pathway. And then um, additionally, the autophagy pathway, um, this is uh, an important uh, cellular process that's involved in, in starvation, so, which involves uh, taking in components from the cell and, and recycling them to um, allow the cell to continue to live as well as um, uh, cleaning up debris and, uh, and other things that are in the cell, including pathogens. So um, escaping or modulating or somehow handling the autophagy pathway is an important um, hallmark for, for viral uh, protein or viruses in general. So it, it's uh, often instructive to, to ask, you know, how is it interacting with autophagy? Is it stimulating it? Is it uh, um, avoiding it? You know, how does it get in and out of, um, of this process? So to, um, to look a little bit more at this autophagy pathway, um, there's sort of two big uh, arms of what's going on. Uh, one is that the autophagolysosome uh, forms by, by forming this um, uh, phagosome um, within the cellular environment, and then it fuses with uh, the lysosome. And so the lysosome is this end product of um, endocytosis. It goes in through vesicles, through uh, the early endocytosis, the late endosome, and it becomes increasingly acidic where it fuses uh, with the lysosome. And uh, so many of these uh, different parts, um, the virus may want to upregulate to say, um, uh, access um, different components of the um, late endosome and get into the cell, or, and it may want to block or stimulate the, um, the fusion in order to, um, to not get totally destroyed. Um, so our understanding of this is, is ongoing. But uh, there's some interesting connections with the sigma pathway, and then it's shown that the sigma receptor is part of its chaperoning activity, uh, mediates the, the fusion of the auto autophagosome uh, uh, with the lysosome as the last stage of this. So perhaps um, part of what the virus is doing is subverting this final fusion stage in order to um, sort of access the, um, the late endosome, but not actually get destroyed. So um, this is a fascinating area of biology that I'm rapidly learning about, and I'm sure there's, there's um, many more experts on campus or maybe even on the call, uh, but here are some, um, some links if you, if you wanna um, read more about them. Okay, so uh, the other pathway I mentioned was the IL-6, and this is uh, primarily mediated through the IRE1. So uh, it looks like um, there's a nice uh, characterization of paper in 2015 that says when, um, the, um, when you don't have the sigma-1 receptor, the IRE1 rapidly associates and starts signaling, but then it, it gets degraded through um, uh, ubiquination. So if the sigma uh, chaperone is there, then it can stabilize the IRE1 and it leads to a long-term effect of the, um, of the phosphorylation of IRE1 and then the downstream um, in the immune response, the unfolded protein response. So there's this nice paper um, last year in Science Translational Medicine that looked at how the sigma-1 receptor via the IRE1 uh, mediates uh, the inflammatory inflammation and sepsis in animals. So they were um, either using LPS or fecal material and then monitored the survival with this um, you know, challenge of, of, um, of stress. Um, and they saw that um, they did worse without the, the sigma-1 receptor. So um, they did a, a detailed characterization and found um, fluvoxamine, which is a SSRI, um, is able to uh, be a sigma-1 agonist and um, protects against this type of sepsis. So uh, there's a clinical trial now going on at uh, University of Washington in St. Louis where they've, uh, they've used um, this SSRI, fluvoxamine, and it seems to have uh, very preliminary um, benefits for, for helping um, people. So they got up to it as through this sort of anti-sepsis, um, but you know, the, the sigma compounds are doing, doing many things. So I just want to mention one more process that may or may not be involved. And that is that, um, as I mentioned, getting um, 
into the cell and avoiding the, uh, phago uh, the um, autophagy pathway is a hallmark of viruses. And in fact, different viruses tend to get into the early endosome and then into the cell at different stages. And so interestingly enough, um, Ebola and SARS tend to wait until the very uh, late um, endosome, the, the endolysosome stage. It's thought that Ebola gets there because it needs to access NPC1, which is a um, transports cholesterol uh, from the endosome into the cell. Um, but it's um, uh, the sort of the canonical word on the street is that SARS is waiting to this very last in order to access uh, cathepsins, uh, which proteolytically uh, activate uh, some of the spike or some of the, um, the proteins that allow the fusion with the, with the membrane. Um, so it's interesting to think about, you know, are drugs that are targeting disruption of this late endosome um, between different viruses, are they going to have similar effects or not? And, and indeed, there was a um, drug repurposing screen for Ebola um, a few years ago, and they found actually many of the same sigma-like compounds, so sertraline um, and uh, 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 quaparine, and, and others that seem to be um, modulating um, uh, this late endosomal process. So this suggests that maybe it's um, either mediated through the sigma receptor or it's something else that's somehow targeting this, this late endosomal process. So in some ways that's not great because we want, would rather have a more specific process, but if we did understand if that was what was going on, then that might give us a sense of you know, what, en what enzymes or what process needs to be identified within that, that compartment that could be more selectively targeted. So, I think it um, isn't the end of the story, but it does open up um, sort of directions to focus our attention. on. So one of the ways that it might be disrupting this late endosomal uh, process is that these drugs just by chance um, are often characterized uh, not necessarily by their targets, but by their, their chemical properties. So they're often called cationic amphiphilic drugs or CADs, and that's because they have a positive charge at one end and then a relatively greasy rest of the molecule. And one of the uh, unusual things about this is that um, in acidic environments, the positive charge can become protonated, in which case it becomes neutral, and then it is unable to escape from that acidic environment. So it's kind of a one-way street where it goes into an acidic environment and then can't get out. And so it leads to this accumulation in the lysosome because it's at just the right um, uh, low pH. So, um, um, uh, chloroquine, for instance, is a, a well-known um, compound that, that accumulates in the lysosome. It has um, you know, extremely long um, uh, um, resonance in the body, so it's because it's getting taken up, as well as um, uh, several other compounds uh, in the same class. So one of the key things that happens when, it, um, when drugs accumulate in the lysosome is that they um, deacidify the lysosome, and then the enzymes that are there stop working. And so if you zoom in to you know, 1600 magnification or even you know, um, uh, 6500 uh, magnification, you see these uh, very characteristic whorls inside of the lysosome. And this is often called uh, phospholipidosis because the, um, the phospho uh, enzymes within the lysosome um, are unable to process the substrates. And so they just accumulate and they form these, these sort of concentric membranes inside. So this seems like it would be quite toxic, but um, it seems that you know, a hydroxychloroquine, for instance, is well tolerated. So it's, um, the cells are remarkably robust for this, um, this process. And um, I, th I think there's some really interesting ideas about maybe the, uh, the sigma receptors are kind of a canary in the coal mine uh, for this uh, phospholipidosis process, where they're extremely sensitive to this class of drugs in a very promiscuous way, and then it stimulates a um, a cellular processes to try to mitigate some of these, um, you know, um, uh, processes. So autophagy to sort of reuse the uh, lipids that are there and, and some of the other uh, immune response that maybe leads to um, apoptosis to sort of kill the cell if it's, if it's irredeemable. So um, it's unclear if, um, if these drugs are working just from a real physical chemical property or if it's targeting some of the multiple different um, uh, ER stress response pathways. So I think that's an open question that um, we and as well as others are, are actively looking at. Okay, so the other class of drugs that um, or a drug that I want to um, draw your attention to is uh, lactoferrin. And this is a, a fascinating molecule. It's, um, it binds iron. It's in the transferrin uh, 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 family. Um, it's found in clostrum of, of uh, primates. 
and as well as tears and some other other fluids as well. Um, but it it's been um, used or thought you know explored in a variety of different ways. And the you know the general narrative is that um, um, mothers produce uh, this to protect uh, newborns from infection before the immune system of the babies can be fully developed. Um, so it works in a variety of different ways, but um, two ways that I want to highlight is that it um, seems to bind uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycans. And it's thought that before the virus actually um, interacts with the um, ACE2 receptor, that it needs to um, somehow associate with the heparin sulfate proteoglycans on the surface of the receptor before it can get transferred there. So it might actually be interacting with the virus itself or somehow disrupting this, uh, this process. And there's some really interesting structural biology around the role of the proteoglycans both on the receptor and on the host side that's involved in, in mediating this process. Uh, I know Tempris 2 is also here in the, somewhere, which is a, um, a protease that's cleaving not only aspects of the um, viral proteins, but also the ACE2. So I think trying to really map out this process um, is going to shed light on you know, how lactoferrin might be disrupting it. Uh, but uh, additionally, um, there's some sense that um, maybe either through the iron regulation or some other process, um, once it gets into the cells, it's, it seems to be mediating the innate immune response. And um, although it, um, the mechanisms are not fully worked out, a number of people have looked at this for um, um, you know, a number of years. But one of the main advantages of it, uh, at least from a um, drug repurposing perspective, is that you can go into the grocery store or on Amazon and, and buy it. It's um, a generally recognized as safe dietary supplement. Um, we can get it from you know, um, cow milk um, and purified from that. And there's been a, a number of uh, you know, phase one and phase two clinical trials that shows that it's you know, very safe, you know, giving it to um, newborn infants um, in the NICU. So these are very vulnerable population and they seem to, um, to be doing fine with it. So I, um, it seems like a, um, something that could be widely deployed very quickly. And it, if it does have activity, um, then, then that would be interesting. So sort of uh, introduce you to the molecule and let me tell you about uh, what we found. Um, so uh, first of all, it has a, a lovely dose response activity. Um, measuring you know, what is the concentration is a little bit tricky because unlike a small molecule, the concentration depends on the molecular weight. Um, so this seems to be um, you know, uh, quite potent for a protein. Um, and then also um, uh, given uh, our virology experience with uh, um, uh, uh, Carmen and um, Christiana's um, expertise, uh, they were able to do a, a range of different more, more classical uh, virology experiments to measure you know, how effective it is. So uh, this is not just looking for staining of viral proteins, but also you know, the log genome copies of how well can you um, have the reproduction after, after you treat it with it. Um, we also were interested in whether or not um, it needs to be bound to iron or not. So that's the APO versus HOLO, or if transferrin, which is also in the family, works. So it's not transferrin. It is specifically to lactoferrin, which suggests it's not just some nonspecific um, protein um, uh, aspect. It's something specific to do with lactoferrin. And it's, and it's nice to know that both the APO and the HOLO seem to work because it will take up iron once it gets, um, gets access to it. Additionally, we wanted to know um, if it was effective um, before uh, it was, the cells were infected or if it could work after. Um, if it only worked before, that would suggest that it is primarily mediated the initial uh, interaction, but once it got into the cell, there was no stopping it. And although it was more effective uh, before, uh, we did see that there was um, um, still significant activity once it wasn't in, inside of the cell, so 24 hours post-infection. So that suggests that there might be multiple mechanisms of action here. And indeed, um, monitoring many of the downstream innate immune processes, so INF beta, uh, Viperin, ISG-115, MX1, and ITFM3, um, many of these were upregulated um, uh, in the presence of lactoferrin. So this suggests that it is, in some sense, uh, modulating the innate immune process inside of our cells, in the HVH7 cells we tested. And um, uh, uh, lastly, uh, one of the things we wanted to know is whether or not we could um, uh, compete with the binding um, in, a, uh, in a conditions that weren't conducive to actual infection, so at, um, at four degrees, um, uh, so very cold. And what we see is that lactoferrin is able to um, 
uh, affect the, um, the initial binding part, interaction. Okay, so um, where do we go from here as far as drugs? So uh, one of the ideas is that we could take lactoferrin and combine it as a combination with either remdesivir or say hydroxychloroquine. Um, one of the challenges with remdesivir is that it needs to be given as an IV. So you couldn't necessarily tell people to take lacto uh, remdesivir uh, prophylactically because it's, uh, they would probably need to be in the hospital to do it. Um, but uh, hydroxychloroquine is a, sort of a, a, um, an example from this whole class of sigma receptor compounds. And although it's not synergistic per se, it does seem that it's not antagonistic. Uh, there is some, some level of, of additive effect. So you can measure that by increasing the dose oops, of, of one drug or increasing the dose of the other and asking, you know, does the IC50 tend to get better at, at some uh, level of combination of the drugs? So um, if it was um, um, antagonistic, then the IC50 would increase. And if it was I, um, uh, synergistic, then the IC50 would decrease as you, as you titrate any other drug. So um, this is promising that, that this might be a complementary pathway or complementary response um, to the sigma compounds um, uh, as, a, as a therapeutic um, opportunity. Okay, so I'm gonna um, transition here um, to uh, more uh, computational methods in um, some of the modeling we did for this screen. Um, perhaps this might be a good place to stop for a sec if anybody has specific questions about the, um, the drug screen that we did so far. Okay, um, feel free to ask more later or interrupt, interrupt me at any time. So um, going back to this idea of using um, science as models, um, one of the ideas is that with these high content screening, um, what we would like to be able to do is, is, um, is understand what's going on at this, uh, you know, where we have this um, fire hose of information about each cell. So you know, how do we uh, take advantage of all that rich features in order to quantify and build models for it. Um, so I'm gonna go through two tools um, uh, that I've been working on. Um, one is um, more statistically oriented, I'm calling it um, MPSTATS, and the other is more of a machine learning oriented, it's MPLearn. Um, and so uh, this is just kind of a, um, an advertisement for some of the features uh, for the statistical modeling for these experiments. Um, the assay development stage for the SARS-CoV-2 was done at a breakneck pace and uh, so it, it, um, it was an exercise in trying to you know, use these tools um, in real time. So it wasn't necessarily a controlled, uh, you know, very uh, deliberative uh, assay development process. It was real learning on our feet. So we were, we were trying to, um, to make sense of, um, uh, of you know, how, how to adjust the parameters very quickly. So I'm gonna go through just some uh, examples from um, a, uh, a methods chapter that we're working on to develop these tools. So I'm not going to go into the biology of the screen, but just uh, just sort of highlight the types of questions we can ask for these methods. So one of the things we might want to ask is, um, you know, how informative is a feature at discriminating the positive and negative controls? So there's a, a range of different ways of doing this, but one key statistic that's often used in screening is to look at the distribution of the cells under the positive condition and the distribution of cells under the negative condition, and then ask how well separated are these in some you know, metric or some feature or some score? So um, the way to quantify this is with the Z prime, which is some function of the standard deviations and the, the difference. Uh, so uh, just looking at individual features that are quantified from um, cell profiler, um, here are the distributions for the positive controls and the negative controls. And you can see there is some, some separation, right? There's um, you know, some distribution difference, but obviously it's not gonna look uh, super clean like this. So if we, if we compute the Z prime score for each of the features, we see that some features are necessarily uh, more meaningful than others. This was a screen for um, finding drugs that, that acted like Taxol um, in some sort of cancer model. Um, so the idea is that we can take all these different features and somehow combine them together to reach um, sort of a, a more discriminative more holistic view of, of what's separating out uh, um, the different conditions. So indeed, if we group together all the different uh, features by the dye that they came from, uh, we can train these uh, some sort of classifier 
to discriminate the cells based on these, these sets of features. In this case, we were using a relatively vanilla um, random forest classifier, which seemed to be relatively robust and also um, um, you know, able to train it quickly and, and compare across different conditions. So if we have the, in, the features that are extracted from the different dyes, so the, in this case, it was an actin, hooks, or tubulin dye, or the combinations of them, we see that there is uh, an increase in the uh, Z prime score. So above 0.5 is generally what you would want for say a more traditional um, uh, screen. Um, but then if you get up here, you could see, well, actually it's um, the part that's important is if you just have the tubulin and hooks and you don't necessarily need the actin stain. And um, this sort of information is actually very valuable because uh, when you're designing these uh, morphological profiling experiments, one of the considerations is that when you're trying to do fluorescence microscopy, that there, um, each dye has an excitation spectrum. So this is you shine light at it and it absorbs energy. And then it has an emission spectrum where once it's absorbed the energy, then it emits the energy back out that, that is, can be observed by the camera. So what's really important is that when you have multiple dyes on a sample, that the spectrum of the different dyes, the emission and the excitation, um, are spectrally separated because you don't want one dye to be stimulating another dye and then getting fluorescence that way rather than actually having the dye, um, you know, fluoresce when it becomes in contact or activated as a, um, both as a small molecule or maybe it's a, an antibody dye, for instance, or like luciferase or something. So if you can exclude dyes that are not necessarily meaningful, like they don't increase the Z prime score, then that gives you more spectrum in order to add an additional dye for maybe an additional uh, cellular process that you might care about. Like for instance, you might tag a very specific protein that you wanna say, you know, how does this protein respond in conjunction with you know, the general cellular phenotypes like the size of the nucleus or the texture or you know, a, how punctate the staining is in the cytoplasm and things. Um, so, so being able to sort of summarize, you know, um, and be able to select uh, meaningful dyes is, is a useful uh, criteria. And then another uh, uh, consideration is that because these experiments are so close to the phenotype, they're often very sensitive to batch conditions. So uh, what we want to see is that um, across uh, if the experiments done at multiple days or across weeks, um, or if there's um, multiple plates on the same day, or if you have um, some sort of plate effects where the edge of the plate is different than the interior, like maybe the temperature range was slightly different across the plate. So it, once you, if you identify a batch effect that might, uh, might be meaningful, you, this allows you to design experiments that might be um, more uh, generalizable. So like for instance, if you find that the edge of the plates are more sensitive than the middle, you could exclude um, putting key samples on those parts, or you could randomize the samples on the plate or if you see that there's real variability between plates, then this might mean you might need to do several biological replicates across different days and then try to generalize um, with, uh, between, between those different experiments. So the aim here is not necessarily to um, correct in the, um, uh, in the random forest scores for these effects, although that can be done. It's really to guide the experimentalist in order to uh, see what degrees of freedom they have in order to control their experiments so that way they can design experiments that are gonna to lead to better, better, uh, more generalizable um, findings. So here is um, sort of a scatter plot with under each one, and then you can see if these scatter plots, uh, this is another view of it, is um, distributions um, for, uh, for the individual uh, treatments. So um, this uh, framework uh, is built in R, it's on top of the grammar of graphics. Um, this is really my go-to technology for, for being able to make lots of small multiple plots and, and really map data to the visual spectrum. So um, I'm a, I use this every day and, I, and I'm happy to talk with people about it if they want to come and chat. Okay, so the other effect that can be um, important is um, however the score is computed, like for instance, if we're trying to count the number of infected cells in the well, is that there can be some very um, difficult to mitigate confounding effects. So one of them that is important to check is that um, if, you, uh, if your treatment kills cells, then fewer of them will, might look sick. So the fraction of cells that are not sick might actually improve with a very toxic drug. 
Um, so if you're trying to find something that's like a, you know, killing a cancer cell line, for instance, this could give you, you know, the exact opposite effect that you would um, want to see. So it's important to sort of measure where you can um, the confounding uh, um, effects and see if they're uh, um, not just uh, statistically different between patches, but if they're um, predictive of the score that you care about. And if they're predictive, then that suggests you might want to correct for them in kind of a causal inference way or design an experiment that mitigates these effects in some way. So trying to understand these sort of statistical properties of the experiment um, is typically done for um, high throughput screens, like for instance, would be done in pharma regularly, but they become um, sort of more, uh, more interesting, I guess, in the high content screening where we suddenly have measurements of lots of things and able to actually control for a range of different uh, confounding uh, dimensions. I think there's some really interesting ideas of, of trying to actually um, use um, machine learning to, um, to, to um, uh, more systematically correct for confounding experiments. So trying to learn models for the, um, the confounding variables and then trying to factor that into, um, to say, a deep learning predictive model. So that's some of the directions that I'm interested in going soon. Okay, and then finally, the MP stats um, gives you ways of fitting dose response models and other parametric forms for, um, for the, the, you know, the, the parameter that you actually care about at the end of the day. And um, so many of these, uh, what we want to say is not just, you know, how, um, you know, what are the parameters, what is IC50, but, you know, how well does it fit? Um, is there uh, other models that fit better? Um, do we see, um, you know, um, effects based on the um, dose? And then also how confident are we in these decisions? And th this is um, something I think is misunderstood with, uh, you know, high throughput experimentation is that there's the sense that we don't actually need to quantify uncertainty as you get to, you know, higher dimension, you know, higher throughput readouts. Um, but it's a bit like um, saying you don't need algorithm um, theory in order to work on bigger computers. And in fact, that the power of better algorithms improves um, with better computers because of uh, asymptotics in the same way that getting more, uh, more control of the uncertainty and the high throughput experimentation leads to, to um, much more efficient usage of the, of the plate real estate, of you know, how many replicates do you need, and, and other criteria. So really, um, I think there's a, a real uh, room for, for more detailed quantification of our uncertainty, and especially in trying to design experiments that are really um, uh, trying to reduce our uncertainty in, in, in places that we really care about. OK, I'm going to um, transition now to, from statistics into um, some of the uh, machine learning and some of the um, ways of, of, of capturing the, the whole distribution of, the, of, of all of the cells. So um, it's instructive to think about uh, you know, this shape of the data that we have coming in. So here we have this big feature matrix of a cell index by a feature index. And the cell index might have some sort of different treatment conditions or plate IDs and other metadata associated with it. And the feature index might have, you know, which dye it came from, you know, what type of, is it a nuclear feature, is it a cytoplasmic feature, and so on. And so the sense is, you know, how are we supposed to understand this really big feature matrix? And so one thing you could think of doing is um, not only do we have the individual features, but we have all the individual functions of all the features. So um, you could just picture like linear regression. We have you know, all the individual predictors, but we also have all the you know, pairs of predictors, so higher order ones. And then you can think of you know, very nonlinear features. Um, so you can get into um, you know, deep learning, uh, feature representation learning, and things like that. So this, this matrix is actually really quite large. And, and you know, one natural way to, to sort of expand the feature representation is just to say, you know, um, what are the cells that are both adjacent to the cell on the plate or you know, adjacent to the cell in the neighborhood of the feature space, of whatever feature space, base space you're looking at. So within this big, large feature matrix, um, now we're trying to understand the structure of what's going on here. And um, many other um, bioinformatics um, fields are wrestling with this idea of, of this um, huge single cell by, uh, by feature matrix. So I know uh, certainly within the department, there's a big emphasis on the um, single cell transcriptomics. And in there, the feature index is not necessarily morphological features. It's um, you know, the expression uh, in some sense of, uh, of individual genes. So in those experiments, the dimensions might be you know, um, 
you know, 20,000 genes, but maybe a couple hundred that are, you know, highly variable across the experiment um, by, you know, in some cases, hundreds of thousands. And, you know, I think they're starting to get into millions of cells uh, for, you know, the largest um, transcriptomic experiments. But, you know, run of the mill ones are in the, you know, 10 to 50 to 100,000 range. So here what we've got is, you know, 100 or a couple hundred uh, morphological features and just um, based on the follow-up dose response screen, so not the, the 25 plates, we ended up with uh, you know, tens of millions of, of individual cells. So this becomes, um, you know, I think, pushing the state of the art in terms of you know, how, do we, how do we handle feature matrices this size that's perhaps only um, um, uh, handled at, at you know, web scale types of questions of you know, social media and things like that. So I think you know, there's some really, um, this is a really interesting domain for uh, for applying these sort of general general methods for trying to understand these big big um, big matrices, but um, I'm, just the flavor of how I like to think about this is that really there's um, two complementary problems that we want to try to solve here. And the first is that we want to try to in, uh, cluster the cells, so find groups of cells that are all behaving in a similar way. So this might be ones that um, you know have uh, maybe there's mixes of cell types or mixes of, or morphologies. Um, and then um, additionally, if we can identify a subset of cells that say are permissive to infection, like we were only noticing that maybe five, 10% of cells were being infected, if we could somehow identify what, which ones were even close to being infected, then we could condition on, on, on those features. And then we would get a much more sensitive measure of how the drug is affecting this, this really the subset of permissive uh, phenotypes. So you could also picture this as important in you know, other sort of treatment effects where if let's say you, you have a homogenated tissue and you're really interested in how it's affecting immune cells, that if you could somehow identify the immune cells up front, then you could really uh, zero in on, on uh, how, the, uh, how it's affecting those. So a complementary effect is that in addition to uh, clustering cells, we also wanna cluster you know, what are the features that are really identifying distinct morphological features of, of the cell. So this leads to um, the sort of feature space clustering. And here, what we wanna do is identify um, features that are, are really characteristic or represent um, distinct biological processes. And this opens up the possibility of having these be endpoints for um, comparing them with other methods. Like for instance, if we are able to identify properties of the cell that are undergoing mitosis, then that might be a way that we could um, uh, sort of filter or merge with, with other data sets. But typically, the, the, you can't do either of these independently, and it's useful to sort of go back and forth between uh, feature engineering and, um, and uh, distribution engineering. Okay, so um, um, uh, about the time that I was um, doing the statistical modeling with Johnny about this um, design of, of experiments, um, from some of the virtual screening experiments that we were doing um, on another project, uh, we had um, you know hundreds of millions of of make on demand compounds, and we wanted to know, you know how are these compounds um, you know are there areas of chemical space that are more likely to interact with the receptor than not, and can that focus our energy on on which ones are actually going to virtual screen into the receptor? So you know we would want to find the docking pose within a, a given receptor. And it takes some sort of computational simulation to put the compound in there. So if we could somehow focus on a subset of chemical space, then then we could spend more time on each compound to really evaluate it closely. So we, I, I um, had a lot of fun learning how to do this um, uh, embeddings and, and figuring out how to do these large scale um, UMAP embeddings. Um, many people use TSNE in other ways. Um, but so I took some of these methods that I had developed here and I said, you know, what, what can we do with them for this morphological profiling? So just uh, from this experiment um, with the 17 million cells, the, um, the uh, dose response plates, um, I just want to, just because this is a tools and tech talk, I want to go through some of the, um, the you know, details of, of how this might work. So um, we were running it on uh, EC2 instance on Amazon. It's got this massive um, you know, 300 plus gigs of memory. And we were primarily using Pyro as the data exchange format in out of the S3 buckets. So for pre-processing, um, it was really helpful to talk to Josh Walsh. He gave me some pointers and, and you know, how people typically do it for single cell RNA-seq. And what we did is um, do a low variance um, filter for features, pre-plate standardized because we did see some uh, plate effects, 
And then we did this same somewhat nonsensical thing of doing um, principal component analysis where we keep all of the dimensions, so full rank. And what this tends to do is, is pull out individual features that uh, are dimensions uh, as a linear transformation that are capturing different aspects in the data. So if we have collinear features, then this um, somehow spreads them out and helps um, the UMAP to try to um, converge more quickly. So we couldn't actually fit all these cells and all these features um, into memory. So what I did first is embed 2 million cells um, using uh, these parameters for the UMAP, which took about eight hours per run. And then um, we re-embed the full set um, in batches uh, one at a time. So once we had the projection onto the two-dimensional surface, then we could uh, put all the cells onto it. Um, so um, I assume you all have at least heard of UMAP embeddings, the stochastic neighbor embeddings of some sort, but the basic idea is that you know, we have these high-dimensional uh, representations and we're trying to project it down. And we want to not just use principal component analysis, but we want to use some sort of nonlinear uh, projection to maintain cell, uh, some sort of notion of distance. And uh, there needs to be some sort of um, uh, resolution at which the uh, distance is measured. So either the very fine grained distance or sort of the global picture in UMAP um, for, for a variety of reasons has um, relatively good default parameters for, um, for coming up with, um, with embeddings that look um, somewhat sensitive. And then finally, we used um, PyViz and Jupyter Notebooks with Holoviz and Datashader for visualization. Um, so um, I'm going to go through some of the controls that, um, uh, that we looked at. So we could look at, um, you know, how do the embeddings change across plates? You know, are there differences? Um, and we do see differences in embeddings. So some, some of what, they're, what the um, embeddings is learning is the difference between the plates. So we have to sort of be careful of that and make sure that we're interpreting things appropriately. Additionally, uh, the embedding process is random. So if we start with different random seeds, we get different embeddings. Um, although you can still see that there's this large cluster in the middle, and then there's, I think if you squint, you can find uh, many similarities between these different lines. So we were relatively happy with the reproducibility uh, as far as the random seeds go. And then um, to look at these, um, we identified regions of interest. And um, from that, we were able to go in and look at the cellular phenotypes uh, from cells in those uh, regions, and also how their distributions change across drugs. So we use uh, cluster 15 as a reference, and then we were able to compare other clusters and say which features are important for discriminating cluster 15, and how do um, drugs affect it. So this was a cell division cluster. We found this very punctate cluster on the side. Um, and then additionally, we found that um, cluster three and four, which are over here, as well as one and two, are, are primarily the infected cluster. And indeed, drugs that are effective at blocking um, the level of infectivity also reduce the density in those clusters. So if you look at the treated, uh, untreated and no virus uh, controls, the negative and positive controls, you see that this large cluster really disappears in the no virus cluster. So that suggests that those are the infected cells. So if we took, I took this um, cluster and then re-embedded that, so it's 2.4 million cells, um, and it, we get a new embedding, and now we can ask, you know, how are the drugs affecting the different uh, cells? You know, are there different um, ways of processes along the, the, um, the infection process? So um, looking at individual features across here, one of the things that we see is that um, most of these cells down here are the ones that are actually infected, and the ones that are up here are just adjacent to infected cells. So the red points here are ones that are coming from here, and this eight and two are ones that come from clusters that are down in this region. Okay, um, and then if we pull out individual cells, uh, we, we can see that there's different phenotypes for the actual cellular morphologies, and this gives us hypotheses for, for you know, um, mechanisms of action at these particular points. We understand something about cell biology based on staring at a lot of cell pictures, and that it gives us a real intuition about you know, which processes are involved. Is it um, the phospholipidosis, for instance. Um, so just uh, one way to quantify this is to look at the relative distribution of, of different clusters of different drugs. And so we see ones that target the cellular entry process, SR1A and the ZAFMK, um, have a different distribution across these different clusters as, the, um, as you increase the dose of the drug compared to ones that may be mod, um, modulating the viral replication process, you know, the, um, the RNA transcriptional translational. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm just about out of time. 
Um, thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions, but um, thank you very much for, for uh, coming out. Okay, I, I, I appreciate your attention. If you're still here, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, for your uh, seminar. Good talk. Okay, see you next time.